Suppose we have a kernel function k on x, we can regard this as a univariate function of one of the variables parameterized by the other variable. Using these parameterized functions, we can define a space of functions consisting of linear combinations of these parameterized functions. And on this space, we can define a product. So any two elements, say f and g of this space, they can be represented as a linear combination of these parameterized functions with some coefficients, let's say ai and bj's. And we can define their product f comma g as this using the coefficients and the kernel function. We can show that this product is actually an inner product. And this inner product induces a reproducing kernel Hilbert space with this kernel function being its reproducing kernel. So, in this video, we will see how we can produce a reproducing kernel Hilbert space starting from a kernel function. Okay, let's start. So, the first thing we need to check is that this product is well-defined. What we mean by well-defined is the following. First of all, these functions you know, there are many functions included in this space, but uh, they may not be linearly independent. So some of them may be redundant or some of them be linearly dependent. So it's possible that the same function can be represented in multiple ways. Let's say f can be represented as sum of ai times kxi, but this can be also represented as sum of a m prime times k x m prime and the function g can be represented as j b j k y j and also represented as b n prime and k y m n prime so according to our definition of this product the product between f and g can be either let's say ij and aibj k of uh, yj xi or this can be also uh, m n a m prime b n prime k n y n prime x m prime or any combinations of these two representations we would be in trouble if these two quantities have different values. So that means depending on how we represent the functions f and g, the value of the product is different. But we can show that that is not the case. That means irrespective of the representation, the product has the same value. That's what we mean by the product is well defined. Okay, let's show that. So we assume f can be represented in these two ways and g can be represented as in these two ways. And that means for any x in the set x, we have f of x is equal to sum of a i k x i of x, which is equal to sum of a m prime k x m prime of x. And same for g. So g of x is equal to uh, b j k y j of x, which is equal to b n prime k x n prime of x. Now, let's recall the definition of this parameterized function k x of y. This was equal to k of y x. But k is a kernel function, so it's symmetric. So k of yx is equal to k of xy, which is, in the parameterized form, it is ky of x. So our goal here is to show that this quantity is equal to this quantity, assuming these two representations for f and these two representations of g. Okay, so let's start from this. i, j, a, i, b, j, k of y, j, x, i. So this is equal to, first let's sum over i, j, b, j, k. Let's swap 
uh, these arguments using the symmetry this and using the parameterized form we have vj and k y j of x i now this part is g so we have another representation so a i and sum over n b n prime and k y n prime of x i now let's exchange uh, these sums and first sum over n and then sum over i and now swap the parameter and the argument so k x i of y n prime now this part is a representation of f and we can use the other representation that is m a m prime and k x m prime of y n prime and now let's use the bivariate form of this kernel function and also rearranging the sum we have m n a m prime b n prime and k of y n prime and x m prime so this quantity is equal to this initial expression for the product therefore the value of the product as defined in this way does not depend on how we represent the functions this or this or this or this therefore this product is well defined and next we show that this product is actually an inner product meaning this satisfies all of the axioms of inner product okay so let's prove them one by one and the first thing is this if f g h are functions in this space v we have the following now by the way we omit the subscript v in the following for simplicity so f times g plus h is equal to the product between f and g plus the product between f and h so let's show this let's assume the following representations for the functions f g and h f is sum over i a i k x i and g is sum over j from 1 to m and b j k y j and h is sum over l from 1 to n c l k z l now let's define g plus h as this j from 1 to m plus n and b j k y j so for this we define uh, b let's say b m plus l as c l for l from 1 to and so on up to n y j uh, y m plus l as uh, z l uh, same for this so by redefining these coefficients and points uh, we can represent g plus h as this j running from 1 to m plus n okay now if we calculate the product between f and g plus h then this becomes sum over i and j uh, you know the range of i doesn't matter it, it starts from one to some num some finite number but it we don't care anyway so i and j and uh, a i b j and k y j and x i but we can split this summation and i and j from one to m a i b j k y j x i and i and j from m plus 1 to m plus n and a b j k y j x i but this one is nothing but the product between f and g and this one is the product between f and h you know we can just replace bj here with uh, cl and yj here with zl 
by appropriately changing the indices. So we prove this is equal to this. We can similarly prove f plus g times h is equal to the sum of f times h plus g times h. But we will omit the proof. And the next axiom we need to show is this. Let's say alpha is any real number. We should have alpha times f times g is equal to alpha f times g, which is also equal to f times alpha g. OK, let's show this. Alpha times f times g. And using the same representations for f and g as before, this is equal to sum of i and j, a i, b j, k of y j, x i. So this is just real number times sum. So we can just put this alpha inside and we have sum over i j alpha times a i. Let's put this way. j and k y j x i. So by definition, this is equal to the inner product between sum over i alpha a i k x i and sum over j b j k y j but this one is of course uh, alpha times this a i k x i j b j k y j but this is f and this is g so this is alpha times f and g and similarly we can prove that instead of grouping like this but we can group like a i times alpha b j and we can also prove that this is equal to f times alpha g the third axiom is the symmetry. f times g is equal to g times f. But this is almost trivial uh, due to the symmetry of the kernel function. So the left hand side here is sum over i and j, a i, b j, k, y, j of x, i. But by symmetry, this is equal to, and we can also uh, swap the order of this summation, and j i, b j, a i, k of a, x i, and y j, which is equal to the product between g and f. So it's done. And the next axiom is positive semi-definiteness. That means for any function f, f times f is greater than or equal to zero. And this is almost trivial due to the positive semi-definiteness of the kernel function in general. But anyway, this one, left hand side, is equal to i and j and a i, a j, k of x j and x i. But due to the positive semi-definite of the kernel function, this is of course greater than or equal to zero and we are done. And the last axiom uh, is this. f times f is equal to 0 if and only if f is identically equal to 0. This one requires more preparation, so we will prove this later. So assuming you accept this final point, this product in, is indeed an inner product defined on the space V. And next, we show the following theorem. For any function f in the space V and any point x in the set x, we have f of x is equal to the inner product between f and kx. This means the function k is a reproducing kernel. OK, so let's prove this. Since f is an element of this space V, f can be represented as a linear combination of the kernel functions. So a i and k x i, let's say. So f of x is equal to sum over i a i times k x i of x. And 
so this one is actually equal to k of x and xi. But this is, according to the definition of the inner product, is equal to the inner product between sum over i, k, x, i, and k, x. You see, this is a function consisting only of k, x. Okay, so, but this one is equal to f. So this is equal to f times k, x, and we are done. Okay, next we show the cauchy schwartz inequality for this case. For any f and g in this space v, we have the inner product between f and g, its absolute value squared is less than or equal to the inner product between f and f times the inner product between g and g. As you might guess, this f times f or g times g, they are used to define the norms of the function. So this will be equal to f norm squared and this will be equal to g norm squared, but that will be done later. So let's forget about that for now. So we will prove this. This can be proved as usual actually. So we already know that this inner product is positive semi-definite. So for any real number t, we have the following. So uh, the inner product between t times f plus g and t times f plus g. So this is always non-negative. So if we expand this by using other uh, properties of the inner product, this can be written as t squared times f times f plus 2t times f times g and plus g times g. So here we are not assuming that f is non-zero or whatever. So this thing, f times f, can be zero. So we need to consider two cases, depending on whether this is zero or not. So if f times f is equal to zero, we should have 2t times f times g plus g times g is greater than or equal to zero. But this should hold for all t, which is a real number. For this to be possible, then this should be zero. Then, otherwise, you know, if this is non-zero for some large value for t, then this may be negative or positive. It, so it depends on the value of t. So, but this should be greater than or equal to zero irrespective of the value of t. So this should be zero. Okay, so if this is zero, then this is zero. That means we have, no, this is zero and this is zero. Therefore, both the right-hand side and the left-hand side, they are both zero. Therefore, this inequality holds. So that's okay. So then the next case, if f times f is non-zero, then this is a quadratic form in T. That means the discriminant of this form should be negative. And the discriminant is f g squared minus f times f. So this square minus this times this. So g times g, so this should be negative. Therefore, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality holds. So either case, they hold, uh, the inequality holds, and we are done. Now we can prove the following. If f is an element of the space V, then if f times f is equal to zero, then the function f is identically equal to zero and vice versa. Of course, this direction is trivial. If f is identically equal to zero, f times f is of course e equal to zero. So we prove this way. Okay, so suppose 
we have f times f equal to 0. Then, uh, the absolute value of f of x, so this x can be any element of the set x. According to our previous theorem, this is equal to the inner product between f and kx. Now, this is less than or equal to, uh, let's try squared here. This is less than or equal to the inner product between f and f times the inner product between kx and kx. But this is zero, so this is zero. Therefore, f of x is zero for any x. So that means f is identically equal to zero. It's a zero function. Now we define the norm of function f as the square root of the inner product between f and f. So we started off with a kernel function from which we define a space of functions spanned by the kernel functions. And on this space, we define the inner product between any two elements in this space. And from this inner product, we define the norm of functions. And by completing the space V with respect to this norm, so V completing completing, so that means any Cauchy sequence is a converging sequence, completing. We can get a Hilbert space, which is uh, indeed a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And with this K, with this K being the reproducing kernel. Although we don't give a proof, this procedure is always possible. That is, starting from a kernel function, we can construct a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this space is unique. This theorem is called more Aronshain theorem. Okay? And as you can guess, in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, we always have a cauchy schwarz inequality. That is this and triangle inequality, f plus g uh, less than or equal to the norm of f plus norm of g. And we can also introduce the notion of orthogonality between functions, that is, if f and g, their inner product is equal to zero, then we say f and g are orthogonal to each other. And of course, the reproducing kernel f of x is also a function uh, on x. So kx of y can be expressed as the inner product. So that is kx times ky in this uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Now, here is an important property about the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Suppose k is a kernel function on real numbers and hk is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space of k, uh, uh, induced by this kernel function k, then if k of xy is continuous on both variables, then uh, any function f in this Hilbert space is continuous. Okay, so let's prove this. Uh, first consider kx minus ka norm squared. This is just an inner product, kx minus ka times kx minus ka. So let's uh, split this, and we have kx times kx minus 2, kx times ka, uh, and also ka times ka. Now, uh, using this relation, uh, this one is 
kx of x and minus 2 and this is kx of a and this one is ka of a now using the bivariate form kx of x is k x x and minus 2 k a x plus k a a but this converges to k a a and 2 k a a plus k of a a which is equal to 0 as x goes to a because we are assuming that this kernel function is continuous on both variables. So this converges to zero. That means for any function f in this Hilbert space, we have uh, f of x minus f of a. So this should be equal to the inner product between f and kx and the inner product between f and k a right so this is uh, equal to the inner product between f and k x minus k a and using the cauchy schwarz inequality this is less than or equal to the norm of f times the norm of k x minus k a but this converges to 0 as x goes to a, because this converges to 0. Therefore, f is continuous. But to be exact, it should be continuous at a, but uh, a can be any real number. So f is a continuous function, and we are done. And finally, we show the following theorem. So first, let k be a kernel function on x and x1 x2 and so on up to xn be elements of the set x then we can define a matrix k uh, k x1 x1 k x1 x2 and so on k x n x n so we have this matrix and uh, we can state the following one the functions k x1 uh, k x2 and so on k x n these are linearly independent and two k is invertible Invertible means it's a regular matrix or it doesn't have any zero eigenvalues. Okay, uh, so these two conditions are equivalent. So that's the statement of the theorem and let's prove it. Uh, before proving, let's make some preparation. So let's say C is a vector, C1, C2, and so on up to Cn. It's a column vector. And the norm squared of uh, this function, sum uh, i c i k x i squared. So this is a norm in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this is equal to the inner product, i k x i. Uh, let's use different indices, c j k x j and and this is the inner product in the hilbert space and by the definition of this inner product it is equal to i j c i c j k x j x i okay now let's rearrange this a little bit and uh, let's see x i uh, sum over j 
sum of i, c i, k, x, j, x, i, uh, times c, j. So this is uh, actually the, this is a matrix product, k times c transpose times c, which is the inner product between k, c, and c in the n-dimensional real vector space. Now, we prove uh, first one implies two. So assuming that uh, these are linearly independent, we prove k is invertible. So we prove this by uh, proving the contrapositive of this statement. That means, suppose uh, k has an eigenvalue of 0. Value of 0. So that means k is not invertible. Okay. Now, if C, which is non-zero, is the corresponding eigenvector, meaning uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue of zero, then we have k times c is equal to zero times c, because zero is the eigenvalue here, but this is zero vector. So k times c is equal to zero vector. That means k c c, so this inner product is equal to zero. But this inner product, according to this process, means this is equal to the sum over j c j k x j. This is equal to zero. That means this linear combination c j k x j is equal to zero. But c j's, they are not, uh, you know, some of them are non-zero. So that means uh, the vectors k, x, j, they are not linearly independent. So we are done. So 1 implies 2. And next we prove the converse, that means 2 implies 1. So again we prove the contrapositive of this statement. So suppose these vectors k, x, j are not linearly independent. Then we derive that sum of the eigenvalues are zero. Since these vectors are not linear independent, there exists some uh, real vector C such that uh, sum of this linear combination C, J, K, X, J is equal to zero and uh, C is non-zero. And since the matrix K is symmetric, so we can use the spectral decomposition of this matrix K. So let's assume this can be decomposed into these components. Lambda i, so these are eigenvalues. And ui, these are eigenvectors. ui transpose. Now, so Kc times C. This is equal to using the spectral decomposition i lambda i u i u i transpose c times c. Now, of course, this is in the real vector space. This is equal to, so this one is equal to the inner product between u i and c. And now use this. So now this is a real number, so we can put this outside. And uh, this is i lambda ui c times, so this one remains inside, ui and c. So we have two factors that are identical. So this is, uh, wait a minute, lambda i here. And uh, this is u i times c in a product squared. On the other hand, since we're assuming this uh, due to uh, 
linear dependence sum over j c j k x j of x i for any x i is equal to zero right so that means this k times c is equal to zero vector and this implies the inner product between kc and c is equal to zero so that means this is equal to zero okay but since the matrix k is positive semi-definite uh, this is due to the positive semi-definiteness of the kernel function all the eigenvalues are non-negative and also note that the vector c cannot be orthogonal to all the eigenvectors so there exists some eigenvector let's say ui0 such that the inner product between c and ui0 is non-zero okay and this implies the corresponding eigenvalue lambda i0 is equal to zero otherwise this quantity cannot be zero so this implies k is not invertible and we are done okay that's all for this video see you next time thanks for watching if you like this video please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel See you next time. Bye.